As you join Professor Steve Gillen in thinking about the upcoming lecture, consider the following three questions. Today I want to talk about the black struggle to gain political power and to get the right to vote in the South. In addressing that issue, there are three questions that we have to keep in mind. First is what was the significance of Freedom Summer and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964? Second, why is the campaign in Selma considered the high watermark of the civil rights struggle? And third, what impact did the Voting Rights Act of 1965 have on voting patterns in the South? It's important to understand when we go back, it wasn't that long ago, a little more than 30 or 40 years ago, that blacks in the South were systematically prevented from voting. And most of the mechanisms which the white South had developed to prevent blacks from voting had their roots in the last decade of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century. One of the most common methods was called the grandfather clause. And this clause said simply that you could not vote if your grandfather did not have the right to, vo to vote. And commercially, only those people whose grandparents had the right to vote could vote. Now, it's obvious that in 1890, this law disenfranchised blacks because their grandparents were slaves and did not have the right to vote. Another method was the poll tax. And this disenfranchised not only blacks, but many poor whites as well. And it was simply a small tax that people had to pay in order to vote. And most people who were just barely eking out a living could not, uh, would not put up the money uh, in order to, to go to the voting booth. And the third were literacy exams. And these were applied in different ways to white people and to black people. If you were white, in order to pass your literacy exam, some examiner would ask you, for example, how to spell your name. If you were black, you would be asked probing constitutional questions, such as what two rights does a person have after indictment by a grand jury? Well, together, these mechanisms in the South had effectively disenfranchised millions of African Americans. Only two million of the South's five million voting age blacks were registered in 1964. In Louisiana, the proportion dropped to 38 31.8%. In Alabama, to 19.4%. And in Mississippi, only 6.4% of eligible blacks were registered to vote. So it was in 1964 that the young civil rights activist in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, decided to organize what was called Freedom Summer. And this was a campaign to register African Americans in Mississippi. The volunteers who participated in this campaign, many of them white students uh, from college students from the North who came down to be a part of the civil rights struggle, encountered fierce and sometimes fatal resistance. In June of 1964, FBI agents pulled the decaying bodies of three workers from an earthen dam near Philadelphia, Mississippi. The autopsy showed that the two white men had been shot in the head the one black man had been shot three times and savagely beaten. And these acts of violence against these young blacks and whites who were a part of Freedom Summer contributed to the growing polarization of the civil rights movement. It did so in a couple of ways. First of all, the intense violence that these volunteers encountered day in and day out made them skeptical of King's message of non-resistance, made them more willing to use violence 
against a system that used so much violence against them. It essentially was turning them away from King's message of nonviolence and away from his tactics, which they considered to be too piecemeal and not aggressive enough. Secondly, it drove a wedge between whites and blacks in the Civil Rights Movement. Many blacks in Mississippi came to resent the presence of these college, white college students from the North. They felt that they were taking over leadership roles in, in, the, in the struggle. But more importantly, it seemed that the federal government only seemed to care about them when a white student was hurt. The federal government mobilized to try to find the bodies of these three students who had been shot and killed and found in Mississippi. But many blacks suffered this type of violence every day, and blacks had been killed for years in the South. But it wasn't until a white college student was killed that the federal government seemed to mobilize. So it created this resentment. And what happens after 1964 is this, the interracial nature of the Civil Rights Movement begins to end as blacks actually expel these white college students from SNCC and from the struggle in the South. They want to create a local democratic structure that, in which blacks play the key role in, in both the leadership and in the membership. And the irony of this, the timing of this, is that the, the white college students are kicked out of the civil rights movement in 1964. So they go back to their college campuses in 1965, radicalized from their experience in the South. So what happens in 1965? Lyndon Johnson decides to send troops to Vietnam. And it is these very same college students who, who become the key movers and shakers in the anti-war movement, which I think emphasizes, highlights an important point, which is the the common roots of protests in the 1960s. A lot of times when we think of the social protest movements of the 60s, we categorize them. We have the anti-war movement, you have the civil rights struggle, you have the women's movement. But the fact is they all grow from a common roots. And in many cases, that common root was the civil rights struggle in the South. Many of the women who would become leaders in the feminist movement in the 1960s and 1970s first got involved in social activism in the civil rights movement in the early 1960s and in SNCC. And they were angered by the way men treated them and that led them to a more radical critique and led them to spearhead the feminist movement. Many of the anti-war radicals who led the effort against Johnson's uh, war in Vietnam, again, had their roots in the civil rights struggle of the 1960s. So in many, in, in many of these causes, it's, you have the same group of people. They share a common membership. And what they all share, to some extent, is either direct involvement or an emotional attachment to this early phase of the civil rights struggle. Well, despite this growing polarization, despite the beatings and the arrest, the volunteers expanded their program to include a challenge to the state's lily white democratic organization. 1964 was a presidential election year, and Lyndon Johnson was running on the Democratic ticket. And the Democratic convention, which was held in Atlantic City, was going to be more of a coronation than a convention, because Johnson had no opposition. And every state elects delegates to go to the convention. The, the uh, established Democratic Party had chosen delegates to go to the convention in Atlantic City. All of those delegates were white. Blacks had been systematically excluded from the process of selecting delegates to represent Mississippi at the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. So what SNCC organizers did was they created their own separate Democratic Party. They called it the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Following the strict letter of the law, they, hold, they held a, uh, various elections. They elected a slate of delegates to go to the convention in Atlantic City. And their delegation was going to challenge the legitimacy of the established democratic organization. And they did so, their claim was that they supported civil rights, that they were a interracial group, and that they were willing to sign a loyalty pledge. They were going to go to the democratic convention, and not only did they represent better than the traditional democratic party, the spirit of the national democratic party, but they were willing to sign a pledge saying they would support the democratic nominee whomever that nominee may be, 
which is something the all-white delegation refused to do. So they went to the convention in Atlantic City armed with moral righteousness, but with little influence. They had hoped that Lyndon Johnson, the person who had pushed through the Civil Rights Act of 1964, who came out in favor of civil rights, would honor the moral claim that they were making to represent the state of Mississippi. But Johnson, again, always the political compromiser, looked for some type of solution. Johnson knew that if he seated the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in the place of the Lily White Democratic Organization, the entire South would walk out of the, out of the, uh, out of the convention. And that would make it harder for him to win by a massive landslide in the general election against his opponent, Barry Goldwater. So Johnson, like Kennedy earlier, tried to find some type of solution, some way of retaining the support of the white South at the same time that he gave something to these uh, to African Americans and the statement they were making. So what Johnson did was he asked Hubert Humphrey, one of the leading liberals in the Democratic Party, to work out some type of compromise. And the compromise they worked out was that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party would be allowed two at-large delegates. They would not represent Mississippi. They would simply be at the convention. They would have votes. The traditional all-white Democratic Party would represent Mississippi. And for many of these African Americans who had endured so much violence, so many beatings, and who had, who had looked to the federal government for hope and for inspiration, were completely disillusioned by this response. They could not understand why the federal government was not responding to their claim. And they also understood that this was the key to Martin Luther King's strategy. King's strategy was to create this sense of moral contrast and provide images of that contrast and to win the North, to, to uh, attract the support of the North by presenting this clear contrast between right and wrong. Well, this is exactly what they were doing. No one could challenge their moral claim. But the Democratic Party and the leadership of the Democratic Party, even prominent liberals like Hubert Humphrey, and even presidents like Lyndon Johnson, who had come out in favor of civil rights, were still treating the issue as if it were just another political issue, just another, that they were just, just another group to be brokered with and to be compromised with. So this experience, missed the Freedom Summer, and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party contributes greatly to the polarization that's taking place in the movement because many of the SNCC members who were involved in both movements were disillusioned by the federal government's response, disillusioned by Lyndon Johnson, less willing to work within the system, less willing to abide by Martin Luther King's message or by his strategy. After Atlantic City, one of these activists said, our struggle was not for civil rights, but for liberation. What they came to realize was the Democratic Party was more interested in power than it was in principle. And if that was the case, how could they depend upon the party in their future struggles? Well, the radical rhetoric and the anger and resentment that grew out of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party convinced Martin Luther King that he had to try to, to make some effort to pass a voting rights bill so that he could reestablish his leadership of the movement and also to prevent these younger radicals, militants, from moving the movement in a more violent direction. So in 1965, King chose Selma, Alabama as the site of his voting rights campaign. We are not asking, we are demanding the ballot, he said. Now, Selma was a city that was fairly evenly divided between black and white. There were 29,500 people in the city, 14,400 whites, and 15,100 blacks. But the voting rolls were 99% white and only 1% black. And King, as he had done in Montgomery and as he did in Birmingham, directed his campaign not at Southern leaders. He was not trying to change the hearts of Southern leaders. He was instead appealing to the conscience of the North, seeking to enlist the federal government in his campaign against racial injustice. 
And success here, as always with King, hinged on the willingness of Southern whites to resort to violence in order to provide him with the compelling images that he needed in order to arouse Northern opinion. Well, the chief obstacle that he faced was Sheriff Jim Clark, known as the meanest segregationist in the South. Clark led a group of deputy volunteers, many of whom were members of the KKK. And in response to black singing, We Shall Overcome, Clark pinned a button on his lapel that simply said, never. King planned to provoke his confrontation with Clark by leading blacks to the county courthouse to register to vote. Always Clark awaited them, either turning them away or arresting them for contempt of court, truancy, or parading without a permit. During one week, more than 3,000 protesters were arrested. Well, the rougher Clark's tactics, the more he inspired his victims to embrace nonviolent resistance. In February, Clark's men arrested 165 protesting youths, forcing them to march three miles out of town, lashing them all the way with cattle prods. Yet two days later, when Clark checked into a hospital with chest pains, he said that blacks were giving him a heart attack, 200 young black children knelt before the courthouse to pray for Clark's recovery. And they held up a large sign reading, get well fast, Sheriff, we miss you. And what's striking about this is that King's strategy was no secret. Everyone in the nation knew what King was trying to do. He was trying to provoke confrontation. He was trying to create these clear images of violence so the people in the North could see the contrast between blacks trying to gain these basic rights that every American took for granted and these arrogant and violent uh, white sheriffs. But for some reason, Clark played right into his strategy. The sheriff just either out of ignorance or arrogance or just pure hatred failed to realize his part in King's pageant of reform symbolism in which every arrest became an indictment of the police. Every beating a way to enlist new supporters to the cause. And as police patience wore thin, their actions became more violent. In February, a mob of state troopers assaulted a group of blacks, shooting 26-year-old Jimmy Lee Jackson as he tried to protect his mother and his grandmother. Jackson's death inspired black leaders to organize a 54-mile march from Selma to the capital in Montgomery to petition Governor George Wallace for protection of blacks registering to vote. On March the 7th, ignoring an order, a court order, forbidding the march, 650 blacks and a few whites assembled at the Brown Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church Absent from the march was Martin Luther King, who had been warned by the White House of possible threats against his life. So King returned to Atlanta. The march was led by the Reverend Hosea Williams, who was a member of King's, a leader of King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and also John Lewis of, the, of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Even despite their differences, they were still able to work together on key events. The march was filed through the back streets of Selma, and headed for the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which crosses the Alabama River. On US Highway 80, 400 yards beyond the bridge, a phalanx of 60 state policemen stood three deep across the four-lane highway. When the marchers came within 100 yards, a state police officer ordered the troopers to put on their gas masks. At 25 yards, the state police major shouted through his bullhorn, turn around and go back to your church you will not be allowed to march any further. You've got two minutes to disperse. The two minutes ticked by. No one moved. Then the major gave the order. Troopers, forward. The patrolmen moved in a solid wall, pushing back the marchers who began stumbling over each other. Suddenly the clubs began swinging. Then came the canisters of tear gas. Within seconds, the highway was swirling with a cloud of white smoke. Choking and bleeding, the marchers fled back over the bridge 
as police on horseback pursued them. Well, the images of this violence shown on the evening news, repeatedly on the evening news, horrified the nation. Public opinion turned decisively against the police in cities across the nation. People streamed into the streets to express their outrage. Editorials in northern newspapers angrily denounced Wallace, Clark, and the troopers. And white supporters began flooding into Selma to help the protesters. But the response to the violence also complicated King's position. Many young radicals, already resentful of King, were angry that he had not participated in the march. And they were eager to repudiate his call of nonviolence. King somehow needed to sustain the moral drama of the march, both in order to, to continue to gain public support, but also to reassert his leadership, which was slipping away. So in Atlanta, King announced that as, and I'm quoting here, a matter of conscience and an attempt to arouse the deepest concern of the nation, he was compelled to lead another march from Selma to Montgomery on Tuesday, March the 9th. So King, on his own, in Atlanta, announced that there would be a new march two days later. But there was a problem. The federal district judge, a man named Frank Johnson, had issued a temporary court order banning any future marches. So this puts King in a very difficult position. On the one hand, King is appealing to the federal government for redress to the problems of African Americans in the South. He does not want to violate a federal court order because he's dependent upon the support of the federal government. He also is, de is dependent upon the national perception of him as a law-abiding citizen. But on the other hand, he's rapidly losing control of the movement. S many members of SNCC are eager to participate in the march and eager for another attempt to engage the troopers. So King can't back down from having a march, because if he does, he'll completely lose support. But he also can't violate the federal order. So what does he do? Well, with the help of a federal mediator, they work out a compromise. And according to the compromise, King would lead the marchers once again over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He would take them to the point where the violence began. He would be greeted at that point by a line of state troopers who would form in front of him. Rather than challenging the troopers or continuing forward, King would kneel, say a prayer, and turn around and lead the marchers back into Selma. So this was, for King, a perfect compromise. It allowed him to regain control of the movement, to lead the march, to assert his leadership but allowed him to do so in a way that did not fed violate a federal court order. Well, there was one big problem with this, and that was George Wallace. Wallace was eager to undermine King's control of the movement and his credibility in the nation. So Wallace worked out a deal with the state police. So on the day that the protest march took place, King, as he had planned and promised, brought the marchers over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He brought them to the point where the violence had taken place. The state police formed the line in front of him. But before King knelt to say a prayer, the policemen moved to the side and symbolically opened the road to Montgomery. And Wallace knew that that move would compromise King one way or the other. Because either he violated the court order and continued the march to Montgomery, or in full view of young radicals in this march, he was going to have to turn around and lead them back into Selma. Either way, King was going to lose. King chose to abide by the compromise that he had negotiated with the federal mediator. And even though the road had opened up symbolically anyhow, King knelt, he said his prayer, and he led them back into Selma. And this is Another one of these key events in the growing polarization of the movement where young radicals are becoming disillusioned with King's leadership. Most of them were not aware of the compromise that King had struck with a federal mediator. And in their mind, 
King was negotiating with the devil. And along with Freedom Summer and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and now the events in Selma, this was leading to what would be a permanent rupture between King and the younger members of the movement. So King may have been successful in Selma in reaching out to the nation, but the movement was crumbling beneath him. Well, President Lyndon Johnson was monitoring these events in Selma from the White House. Johnson had supported a voting rights bill, but he felt that it would be impossible to get it passed through Congress, so he had not pushed the legislation. But now these violent images from Selma provided him with the opportunity that he needed. On Monday evening, March the 15th, Johnson went before Congress to make his case for a powerful new voting rights law. Selma, he told the hushed chambers, marked the second turning point in American history equal to Lexington and Concord. Because it is not just Negroes, he said, but really all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And he said, repeating the mantra of the civil rights movement, we shall overcome. All that remained now was for King to lead the march that he had twice been denied. On March 21st, 1965, King planned a procession of marchers for the four-day trek to Montgomery. Again, when Wallace found out about the plan, he told Lyndon Johnson that he could not guarantee the safety of the marchers. So Johnson called Wallace to Washington for some discussions. And over three hours, some sometimes profane discussion, Wallace found himself overmatched by Lyndon Johnson. If I hadn't left there when I did, Wallace said later, he'd have me coming out for civil rights. The march took place as scheduled. On the final day, the crowd of 25,000 reached the outskirts of Montgomery, where they stopped for an evening of entertainment that included folk singers Peter, Paul, and Mary. Back in Washington, President Johnson was skillfully maneuvering legislation through Congress. The House approved it overwhelmingly, 333 to 85. Southerners filibustered in the Senate, but lost a vote on cloture, 70 to 30, after 25 days of debate. The measure then passed, 77 to 19. And on August 6th, 1965, Johnson signed into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in the same room where Lincoln had once signed the Eman Emancipation Proclamation. The legislation authorized federal examiners to register voters and it banned the use of literacy tests. Today, Johnson said, is a triumph for freedom as huge as any victory that has ever been won on any battlefield. And he was right. The most effective civil rights legislation in history, the act produced a dramatic increase in black voting, a rise in the number of black elected officials, and a cleansing of the poisoned atmosphere of Southern politics, ridding it for the most part of hardened racists and allowing for the emergence of a generation of racial moderates. In 11 Southern states, black registration increased by 10 percentage points from 1964 to 1966 and then by another 15 points in the next four years. The worst offenders underwent the most far-reaching changes. Black registration increased from 19% to 53% in Alabama, 32% to 60% in Louisiana, and in Mississippi, from 6% to 44%. By mid-1966, Half a million blacks had joined the South's voting rolls. And by 1968, nearly 400 blacks would hold elective office in the region. Years later, many critics would complain about the unintended consequences of the Voting Act of 1965. Some southern states, in an effort to prevent blacks from exercising political power, gerrymandered congressional districts so as to damage their political aspirations. In response to that, 1982, Congress amended the Voting Rights Act so as to require blacks and other minorities be given a greater opportunity to elect 
their own to Congress and to state legislatures. And following the reapportionment in, 19, in 1990, the Congress gave sanction to many of these changes. And in 1992, 16 African Americans won election to congressional seats. But these also, this development has also had a, an unfortunate or, or unintended side effect in that the districts that were primarily white then became more conservative. But in 1995, the Supreme Court ruled that efforts to gerrymander congressional districts solely to increase black representation were unconstitutional. And in response to that, now Congress is developing methods that would actually decrease the number of black elected officials. Blacks are also soon to discover, just as women did after getting the franchise in 1920, that there were clear limits to the power of the vote. Johnson had exaggerated in claiming that the vote was, in his words, the most powerful instrument ever devised by man for breaking down injustice. The right to vote could do only so much for black people who faced deep-seated economic discrimination and deep-seated disadvantage. Nearly 30 years following the passage of the Voting Rights Act, for example, the medium household income of blacks in Selma was only $9,600, compared to $25,500 for whites. And more than half of blacks in Selma lived in poverty in 1994. King's successful campaigns in, in Selma his uh, campaign to win passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, I think helped shed insight into the importance of his leadership in the civil rights struggle. It is certainly true that in order to understand the success of the movement, scholars need to appreciate the role of local people, men and women like Robert Moses and Fannie Lou Hammer, who labored in relative obscurity, but whose courage define the movement. Individuals such as these, noted the historian David Garrow, equally merit the designation as civil rights leaders. And some people have gone so far as to suggest the civil rights movement would have occurred exactly the way it had if Martin Luther King had never lived. While it's necessary and important to honor the thousands of African Americans who made extraordinary sacrifices and took great risks to gain their rights, we should not lose sight of the central role played by Martin Luther King. King provided this first phase of the movement, which began in Montgomery and ended in Selma, with a moral vocabulary and a political strategy. His emphasis on Christian love and civil disobedience helped focus national attention on the gross injustice of the South, rallying the entire nation to his cause. And Southern leaders played their role as hate-filled villains to perfection. King also served as a liaison between this local struggle in the South and national political leaders in Washington and the national media in New York. It was Martin Luther King who could go to the White House and meet with presidents. It was Martin, Luther's King, Martin Luther King's face who appeared on the cover of Time and Newsweek. King channeled the power and moral force of the movement into a compelling message. And then he forced the rest of the nation to listen. His role was central to the movement's early success. The Voting Rights Act represented liberalism at high tide. But even as the Civil Rights Movement was achieving its greatest success, the consensus that had taken shape over the previous decade was splintering. And King's leadership was slipping. 